The second generation version of Fiat's cheeky little 500 city car continues on in mild hybrid guise. Otherwise, this stylish package hasn't been fundamentally changed. But then, loyal buyers didn't really want it to be. These people will like the smart look, the various media options, and the very individual feel. You can tell that Fiat knows its market. If ever a car has built its brand, it's this one, Fiat 500. We've had three generations of this car over the years and all have been pivotal to Fiat's existence as a car maker. This is the Cinquecento though that you'll probably most easily recognize, the second generation model, which after 13 years on sale, received its most significant update in early 2020 with the introduction of mild hybrid power. It's all part of a move towards electrification, which has also brought us a more significant milestone in Fiat 500 history. Introduction of a completely new third generation full electric battery powered version. But that new 500 takes the brand into a completely new and much pricier market segment. That for the time being anyway, abandons most of the folk that for the last half a century have made the 500 the enduring success story it is. Which is why to serve those people, this second generation model not only continues alongside its newest stablemate, but has also been rejuvenated with a completely new mild hybrid powertrain that we're going to test today. It's a little strange thinking of this 21st century Mark II model as the basic 500 series alternative. Back in 2007, it seemed such a technological marvel in comparison to the Cinquino original, the so-called Bambino model, which back in 1957 was conceived as an alternative to a scooter. This second generation 500, styled by Frank Stevenson and derived from a Trepiuno concept car first shown in 2004, was like the Volkswagen Beetle and the Mini, a 50s people's model reinvented as a new millennial fashion trinket to great effect. Fiat, of course, tweaked with this second generation design over the years. In 2011, we got a clever twin air two cylinder engine that sounded great, but never got near its quoted fuel stats. Uh, there was a 1.3 litre diesel variant, which was introduced, deleted, and then reintroduced again. And in 2015, there was a facelift with over 1,900 changes, most of which you couldn't see, feel or touch. Throughout, buyers were offered the option of either this fixed top three-door hatch model or a 500C open topped variant of the same body shape that stopped short of being a full convertible, but which offered a fabric folding section in its roof. Both body styles were also offered with 1.4 litre turbo petrol power by the Abarth brand, and that continues here, but in ever decreasing numbers. Otherwise, the only uh, combustion-powered engine you can now get in either this three-door hatch or the 500C is now this one, uh, the previous rather ancient old mainstream 1.2-litre four-cylinder unit replaced by this one-litre three-cylinder motor uh, paired with a 12-volt belt-integrated starter generator and a separate 11-amp-hour lithium battery, all of which develops a modest 70 horsepower. What's on offer here isn't any sort of full hybrid. The car can never drive solely under battery power, but Fiat says this power plant's clever 12 volt electrified architecture can reduce CO2 emissions by up to 30%, which sounds promising. Will it all be enough though to significantly prolong the lifespan of one of this century's most definitive small cars? Let's find out. Get the look and feel of a car like this right and you could argue that it hardly matters how it drives. That's certainly what Fiat has done here. Uh, for most potential owners, how this 500 model feels on the online configurator is more important than how it feels on the road. So it's no surprise for us to learn then that in this Mark II model's first 13 years of life, over 80% of customers happily ignored all the various quite sophisticated engines that the Italian brand was offering at various times with this car. They stuck instead with the entry-level 1.2-litre four-cylinder petrol power plant, which has been placed here in favour of a three-cylinder, one-litre mild hybrid unit.
Now we've seen this Firefly one litre engine with its two valves per cylinder layout before in a couple of uh, FCA group small SUVs, the Fiat 500X and the Jeep Renegade. In the form used in this 500, uh, it's a bit different though. It lacks a turbocharger, but it gains a 12 volt belt starter generator known as a BSG, along with an 11 amp hour lithium ion battery. Uh, those are the major components of the mild hybrid system that the badging of this car now loudly trumpets. In many ways, that's a bit misleading. Uh, there's nothing remotely Prius-like about this car. I mean, you can't drive it solely on its battery. Uh, you certainly can't plug it in. And there's no clever transmission like, uh, say, the clutchless dog box auto of the Renault Clio hybrid. In fact, if you came to this car, as many will, fresh from a version of this Fiat with the old 1.2 litre four cylinder engine, uh, which by the way continues with automatic dual logic variants of this model, uh, you'll probably hardly notice any differences at all. Even the 70 horsepower output of the new power plant is virtually the same as its predecessor was, as are the performance stats, rest to 62 in a leisurely 13.8 seconds, en route to an academic maximum of 150 four miles an hour. Uh, there's not much more pulling power either, just 92 newton meters of it, which means you'll often have to thrash the car along a bit to make meaningful progress. Uh, although the rumbly roar that you get when you do that is actually quite characterful. Still, be all that as it may, uh, what's happening beneath the bonnet as you drive is all very different, as the instrument displays new hybrid readouts seem to suggest. As is the case with all mild hybrid units, uh, like for example the one that Ford now uses in the Fiesta, the belt starter generator harvests energy during braking and deceleration and then stores it in the system's little integrated battery so it can be used in one of two ways, either to aid acceleration or to power the car's auxiliaries as the engine stop start system activates when you're waiting at the lights or in a traffic queue. Uh, there'll never be enough charge generated to power the car without the aid of its combustion engine and even if there was uh, the little battery wouldn't be big enough to store it. What this is then is less a hybrid power plant and more an embellishment to combustion engineering which boosts efficiency and that's by up to 30% in terms of CO2 emissions according to Fiat. Having crunched the stats since the last time we tested the previous version of this car back in 2015, uh, we're struggling to see that actually and we've certainly found it difficult to discern much of the promised benefits and enhanced acceleration. But then we've also found that with all the recent mild hybrid models we've tested. There's a reason why full hybrid tech, such as you'll find on, say, a Toyota Yaris hybrid or on that Clio hybrid model we just mentioned, costs a lot more. Now, assuming you can't stretch the full electric new 500 model, uh, the only other powertrain option in this Fiat, which isn't our focus here, is a 1.4 litre T-Jet turbo petrol power plant, which serves in the various hot hatch bath derivatives, offering 145, 165, or even 180 brake horsepower. That the Italian engineers have managed to make these Arbath variants brilliant fun to chuck around is quite an achievement given that as a design the 500 is engineered around a fairly crude set of underpinnings. Uh, the chassis originates from a Mark II Panda uh, launched way back in 2003 and it comes with suspension that allows low speed bumps to be felt and heard rather too often. Plus the steering of the mainstream models offers little feedback when you're pressing on across twistier routes and through those turns the softer setup of this Fiat means means that you get quite a lot more body roll than you would in rivals like the Mini Hatch. But of course this 500 is far more in its comfort zone around town, where you'll be pleased to find that Fiat has retained the city button on the fascia that lightens steering feel at parking speeds. For urban use uh, we still find the manual gearbox rather bulky, although it does at least now have six rather than five speeds, and it's a bit awkward to try to get into reverse too. Plus, the slightly restricted rearward vision when you're trying to park makes rear parking sensors, which usually cost extra, something of a must. 
Still, as we suggested at the beginning, none of that really tends to matter to most potential buyers who can't look beyond the cute shape and the way that they're going to personalize the paintwork so it looks different when it's parked alongside the others at the gym. Uh, they'll forgive this car much for its trendy demeanor, its cheeky engine note, and its turn on a sixpence maneuverability. Uh, there's a super tight 9.3 meter turning circle. Plus, it helps enormously that the high driving position and the big windows make this car easy to place on the road when you're jinking through town centre traffic. It's urban friendly through and through, you see. Almost anyone knows what this car is, and as far as we can tell, almost every owner of one is female. Offhand, in fact, we can't think of a more gender-specific model in the entire history of the motor car. Now, if you do happen to be male and want one, and you're uncomfortable with that, uh, then you could always dress it up as if it was a sporty, a bath variant. Dressing a 500 up is, of course, key to the appeal of owning one. This car virtually invented the concept of modern automotive personalization. In terms of a starting point, though, not much is different here. Uh, no visual changes have been part of the evolution into this mild hybrid model, so the dinky looks remain as they have been since the facelift back in 2015, when Frank Stevenson's original design got a light wash and brush up. In an age where little hatches often tend to have become rather less little, this one remains appealingly small, still measuring at just 3.5 metres long, 1.6 metres wide and 1.5 metres high, which means it can fit into spaces even a mini hatch would have to avoid. And of course, it's just as cute as ever, with the same lovable, short, curvy dimensions and this distinct crease uh, flowing above the door handles from the front wing to the rear light cluster. Wheel sizes vary between 14 and 16 inches in size. We've got the 16 inch rims here. And now if you choose the 500C variant rather than the fixed top model that we're testing today, you get what amounts to a full length canvas sunroof, which electrically retracts into a concertina bundle just above the boot. If your experience of this car dates to a much older version of this model, it's here at the front that you'll notice most of the changes made as part of the 2015 facelift. Perhaps most notably, the lipstick kissing theme of the LED daytime running lights, uh, which graphically reproduce the zeros of the 500 name and frame lower corner lamps that take care of the dipped beam headlights and the turn signal duties. Uh, the main round headlamps just above feature clever polyelliptical modules for improved nighttime vision. The bonnet retains its distinctive traditional clamshell form and the trapezoidal nose gets pronounced ribbing. The cooling is done by this lower intake with either end of this three-dimensional grille flanked by these little jewel-like fog lights. And at the back, well, other changes made back in 2015, which a customer used to an older version of this design might notice, include the so-called empty light clusters. Uh, they're comprised of ring-shaped structures uh, with body-coloured centres. Incorporating this feature forced the relocation of the rear fog light and the reversing light lower down into the edges of the bumper. Uh, underneath, as before, this car is based on the aging underpinnings of a previous model Fiat Panda, but potential owners rarely know this and they rarely care if they do know. As mentioned earlier, every 500 model invites a high degree of personalization via a myriad of color and trim permutation options, but whatever you choose is sure to dovetail deliciously with the very well-judged blend of retro chic and clean contemporary design in the cabin. Here inside, delicious details are everywhere. The coloured fascia panels feature iconic 500 badging and they're colour matched against the bodywork. Uh, nothing's changed as part of the evolution into mild hybrid power unless you count the increased use of recycled plastic to create these restyled seats. Here the upholstery has been fashioned from uh, what's called sequel yarn, uh, that's derived from recycled plastic, 10% of which originates from the sea and 90% of it from the 
land. Uh, to create this special material, plastic rubbish is reduced to flakes of polyethylene terephthalate, uh, which are then spun into the yarn from which this fabric is made, uh, alongside other natural recycled or recovered fibres. Now that all fits rather with the eco-hybrid theme. It can still feel pretty up to date in here if you spend a bit extra and get this optional 7 inch TFT instrument cluster and this Uconnect centre dash touchscreen. Few 500 owners bother with paying more for the instrument binnacle monitor, although takeout for this feature might be a bit higher now uh, because it's able to graphically show the hybrid system charging up its little battery as you drive it. Uh, other selectable screen options that you can view through this chunky three-spoke wheel include readouts on trip computer data, tyre pressures and range. Plus, this display can also brief you on battery energy generation and show a power charge meter designated by little green and blue strips as the wheels turn. Now, the screen is flanked at its outer rim by readouts for revs on the left and what Fiat calls an eco-index on the right, uh, the latter there to score the efficiency of your driving. This 7-inch central Uconnect Live infotainment display HD screen uh, mounted right in your line of sight high on the dashboard also incorporates quite a lot, although you only get that as standard as an alternative to the base Uconnect radio if you can avoid entry-level trim. 3D navigation can be added in and it's standard at the top of the range. All the Uconnect Live center screen packages include voice recognition, uh, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, uh, a DAB audio system, Bluetooth hands-free calling, uh, music streaming, and an SMS reader that will read out your text messages to you. Um, via the Uconnect Live setup, you can keep up with your friends on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, you can keep up with the news via Reuters. Uh, you can select from more than 35 million music tracks via Deezer and access over 100,000 global radio stations via TuneIn. Not much has changed in terms of getting comfortable. It's still disappointing to find that there's no reach adjustment for the steering wheel and that seat height adjustment is still lacking on the entry level model. Still, the seat itself has been made slightly more comfortable since uh, Fiat ergonomically reshaped it as part of this car's facelift updates. Plus, the upgraded materials that are now used have uh, rather smartened the interior ambience up a bit, although cheaper plastics are still evident the further down you look. Back in 2007, these didn't really detract from what then seemed quite an upmarket feeling fascia. These days, of course, standards have changed a bit. Um, even the cheapest super minis now feature plastics as good or better than those in evidence here. Still, at least the car seems to have been well screwed together in its Polish factory. In-cabin stowage remains acceptable provided your standard of measurement is for a city car and not a larger Fiesta-sized Super Mini. Uh, you won't be short of cup holders, definitely. You'll find two of them uh, both ahead of and behind the handbrake. Ahead of the front cup holders is a cubby with a nearby 12-volt socket. Uh, behind these front cup holders is a USB port. Uh, the door bins are rather slim, but the glove box, that's reasonably sized, and you also get a cubby by the driver's right knee and ticket clips on the sun visors here. Uh, as for all-round vision, well, predictably, a 500 isn't as easy to see out of as its boxier Fiat Panda showroom stablemate, especially when you're looking over your shoulder and trying to park now that might be an issue because rear parking sensors cost extra on most models. At junctions, uh, you'll find that the front A pillars uh, are on the chunky side too. Other issues? Uh, well, not too many. The seat itself is set rather high. That's something you particularly notice if you have a car with this one's fixed sunroof. That's a feature which most variants do now include, but it's one that rather eats into the headroom. Uh, the infotainment screen attracts reflections and the narrow pedal box annoyingly lacks a footrest and it might be a bit tight for those who are over familiar with the offerings of Colonel Sanders. Uh, it's impossible to be irritated with this car for long though. It's just so engagingly designed. The pool ball style gear stick mounted high on the dash here, the Art Deco silver door handles, the earlobe style vents around the infotainment screen, uh, the Bakelite style fitting surrounding the ventilation controls. All of it's fun and trendy and reasonably ergonomic. Time to move into the rear seat.
Well, given that the external dimensions of this car are so short, you won't be expecting to find much room here, and there isn't, uh, taller folk will find their heads brushing the roof. Mind you, that's always been the case in a Fiat 500. Uh, the ceiling of the 1957 original was swept back too, and that was in order to differentiate that from the Fiat 600 model of the day. Now here, the differentiation point is with Fiat's Panda City car, which, by the way, can be had with exactly the same mild hybrid engineering that features is here and is more spacious and practical than a 500 in just about every way. There is a premium to pay for this 500 model's cute stylishness in more ways than one. Larger adults will need to make full use of the elbow cutouts indented into the side panels. Most though will find the space provided just about sufficient for two people on short to medium journeys and it'll probably be fine for kids who of course are provided with uh, Isofix child seat fastenings. You'll only be able to fit in two of them though. Now we were a bit dismayed to find that Fiat charges extra for these rear head restraints with entry level trim. I mean without these there would be neck safety implications for adults travelling back here. Younger folk will appreciate the fact that these uh, side windows, they're quite big, but older offspring, they're going to be irritated with the lack of any sort of USB port back here. Otherwise, uh, there's some reasonable practicality back here, and that's thanks to a pocket on the left-hand seat back and easy access to the central cup holders behind the gear stick. Out back, the boot has a high lip and a narrow opening, and it remains one of the more compact offerings in the segment. Uh, once you get your stuff in past this tiny parcel shelf, though, the 185 litre space provided is no smaller than an ordinary mainstream city car like Toyota's iGo would give you. Now, if you're looking at stylized city car alternatives, uh, well, yes, you would get about 10% more room in a mini hatch, but the capacity provided here is the same as you get in a smart 4.4. This recessed area to the right here means that there's slightly more width for our wider items than you initially think, uh, but bag hooks and the traditional floor tying eyes, they've both been forgotten. And there's no space for a spare wheel of any kind beneath this flimsy floor cover. You would probably want to consider the optional um, luggage compartment organiser to make the most of this space. If you do need to carry more, then you can push forward the rear bench, and that split folds in all but the entry trim level variant. Uh, this frees up 550 litres in this standard hatch model. The folded seats, though, don't get anywhere near to folding flush with the base of the cargo area, and there's no adjustable height boot floor option to even things out a bit. Uh, bear in mind, if you opt for the 500c convertible version, that the luggage capacity figures fall slightly there to 182 litres and 500 and 20 litres. From the launch of this 500 hybrid, pricing sat primarily in the 13,000 to 16,000 pound bracket, reflecting a premium for the electrified technology that Fiat says has been kept to around 500 pounds. Uh, there is a significant 2,650 pound model for model premium if you want the alternative 500C version of the same body style with its electric fabric folding roof section. Here though, uh, we're focusing on the normal fixed top three door hatch, which in manual form is offered only with the one litre mild hybrid engine. What else might you need to know about range structure here? Well, there are five mainstream trim levels, pop, lounge, sport, star and rockstar. And at the time of this test in mid 2020, Fiat was still offering the old four cylinder 1.2 litre petrol power plant to buyers who want to pay the 630 pound premium that's necessary to get the brand's semi-automatic clutchless dual logic gearbox. Uh, for reference, the hot hatch a bath version of this model, which uses a much older but much faster 1.4 litre petrol turbo engine and which isn't our focus here, costs from just over 17,000 pounds. 
onto the value proposition represented by 500 model range pricing as a whole. Now you might think that the most obvious rival to this car is the mini hatch three door, but uh, actually that's these days a slightly bigger and more powerful car, which is much less efficient than a 500. In its least powerful uh, mini one 102 brake horsepower guys, pricing for that mini pretty much starts where the figures for this Fiat finish. Uh, there aren't any other small hatch competitors which quite replicate the retro style package that Fiat offers here. Uh, the Volkswagen Beetle and the DS3, they're both no longer in production. And anyway, like the Mini Hatch, they were slightly larger, pricier cars. Vauxhall's Adam model was closer, but that's now dead and gone too. Which, in terms of competitors to this Fiat, leaves us only with three-door versions of more mundane city cars. And there aren't many of those around these days either. Uh, to try to replicate what Fiat's offering here, you could conceivably buy a three-door version of either the Volkswagen Up, the Toyota Igo, uh, the Citroen C1 or the Peugeot 108, and then add a few trendy touches from the options list. But the end result there still wouldn't be quite the same as what you got from a 500. Still, if you are minded to try to do that, you'll want to know that base three-door versions of the VW Up and the Peugeot 108 cost about the same as this Fiat, but a Citroen C1 might save you a couple of thousand and a Toyota Igo up to 3,000. Ultimately though, there's nothing quite like this Fiat, and if you've come to that conclusion too, then you're gonna to need to know just how generous Fiat has been with the standard specification. Now, base pop trim includes, well, the basics, although it does these days include air conditioning and a DAB radio, as well as a speed limiter and powered mirrors. Upgrade yourself into lounge trim and it all gets a bit nicer. At this level, you get the height adjustable driver's seat and the 50-50 split folding rear bench that rather meanly pop trim makes you do without. Uh, lounge spec also gives you a couple of crucial features, rear parking sensors, which you really need with the restricted over the shoulder view and the seven inch Uconnect live center dash infotainment screen package too. Now this includes voice recognition, uh, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Uh, there's also a DAB audio system, Bluetooth hands-free calling, music streaming, and an SMS reader that uh, will read out your text messages to you. Lounge spec also includes 15-inch alloy wheels, a fixed sunroof, uh, front fog lights, cruise control, and a steering wheel that is trimmed in man-made techno leather. Want more? Then your Fiat dealer will happily oblige. Mid-range star spec adds automatic climate control and a chrome kit to embellish the exterior styling. Or you could go for the more dynamic looking sport model, which has a sports kit, including a rear spoiler, side skirts and a chromed exhaust, along with body coloured sports bumpers, 15-inch uh, satin graphite alloy wheels and a satin graphite finish for the door mirrors too. At the top of the range, Rockstar trim gives you all the features of the Star and Sport variants, but also adds in dark tinted rear windows, chrome kick plates and a 7 inch TFT instrument cluster screen. On to options, and there are lots of them. Now, with most variants, you'll have to pay extra for that 7-inch TFT instrument binnacle cluster screen, which will allow you to better monitor the workings of that mild hybrid engine. Uh, depending on the variant that you've chosen, you might also want to consider things like a full leather interior, uh, climate control, dark tinted glass, bi-xenon headlamps, an electrochromatic rear view mirror, a leather gear knob, and chromed kick plates. Now, if you have a car with a fixed sunroof, you can pay extra at the top of the range to have that feature instead electrically powered. Uh, a full range of Mopar accessories include things like door mirror trims, uh, distinctive side badges, and vintage style wheel trims. And a tailgate rack is also available with two systems for transporting winter sports equipment like skis and snowboards. Uh, you can also have a luggage compartment net, a car cover, and a tow bar. To widen your choices when it comes to specifying the exterior look of your 500, Fiat has introduced a range of body wrappings, all available as part of what it calls a second skin personalization program. Now there are two main options here, uh, the simplest of which applies to both 500 body styles and gives you a fashionable geometric pattern along the belt line of the car. 
Uh, larger second skin options apply only to the hard top 500 model and they cover the pillars and the roof and in some cases the bonnet and tailgate as well. Five main patterns are offered. Geometric, now that's described as an ethnic pattern. Scotty, that's classic tartan. Uh, camouflage for the fashionable military look. Comics in red or yellow, that's a pop decoration finish which works in combination with two colour paintwork. And shades, which finishes your 500 in either Tech House Grey, Bossa Nova White or Smooth Mint. If you don't want to go quite as far as sticking body wrappings all over your car, then your dealer will be happy to offer you a whole range of stripes and sticker sets with, for the roof, a special checkered sticker design or an Italian flag stripe, if you like the idea of either of those. Uh, there are sport packs in red, white or black, which include stickers, mirror covers and key fob colours in one of those three chosen shades. Having a red, black or ivory contrast painted roof is another option. Uh, there's a choice of personalised ignition keys and you might want to look at things like chromed bonnet trim, larger 16 inch alloy wheels, uh, branded side rubbing strip and red brake calipers. Before you finish the whole thing off uh, with your choice from what is these days a much wider body colour palette offering a choice of metallic, tricoat or pastel paint finishes. We've got dew green metallic here. On to safety. Now you don't get any of the latest electronic camera based features that are now creeping onto rival models, but all the basics are very much in evidence. So even the cheapest trim level gives you twin front side and curtain airbags plus a driver's knee bag. There's ESC stability control plus anti-lock brakes with HBA, that's hydraulic brake assistance to help in panic stops. And those will be advertised to following motorists by automatically activating hazard warning lights. On top of that, you get Fiat's ASR and MSR traction control systems, tyre pressure monitoring, and a hell holder clutch too to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. It all justifies this car's five-star Euro NCAP safety test rating. One of the advantages of a small car like this is that a tiny fuel efficient little engine is more than adequate to haul it around. A power plant like the mild hybrid one litre Firefly unit now primarily fitted to this 500. Uh, the electrified system used here recovers energy during braking and deceleration and stores it in a lithium ion battery with a capacity of 11 amp hours and uses it to restart the engine in stop and start mode and to assist it during acceleration. Now this technology allows the internal combustion engine to switch off at speeds below 18 miles an hour at which point a dash display prompts the driver to shift into neutral. If you can't be bothered to do that in traffic you won't get the full potential benefits of the electrified technology here which Fiat ambitiously claims can improve emissions by up to 30%. That's difficult for us to verify since the industry has switched to a different WLTP system for rating emissions since the last time that we tested this car. Uh, the actual quoted figure is up to 119 grams per kilometer. Combined cycle fuel economy is quoted at up to 53.3 mpg, which certainly isn't a 30% improvement. The mild hybrid propulsion unit works with a six gear manual transmission uh, aimed at improving fuel economy in out of town driving. That's thanks to new low friction bearings and gaskets and the use of a specific high efficiency lubricant. If you don't like this rather bulky stick shift, then your Fiat dealer can offer you the old dual logic semi-automatic, although at the time of this test in mid-2020, that could only be had paired with the old four-cylinder 1.2-litre petrol engine, which is nothing like as efficient. Uh, for reference, the stats for a 500 1.2-litre dual logic are 47.1 mpg and up to 136 grams per kilometre. If you have a model with this instrument cluster screen, then you'll get a selectable graphic showing the flow of energy either back into the battery when you're slowing down or to the wheels when you're accelerating. Uh, there is also a selectable power charge screen and there's an eco index readout on the center dial's outer rim. Now that grades you on um, acceleration, on deceleration, on speed and gear shifting for every trip. And you can analyze your eco index score in more detail 
Retail in an Eco Drive section of the Uconnect Center Dash infotainment screen there. That assumes uh, that the version of this Fiat that you've chosen has that feature. Now this assesses your driving style in real time and it'll give you tips to improve it that could improve fuel consumption by up to 16%. An included leaf symbol more graphically shows the extent of your drive and frugality. What else? Uh, well, service intervals are every 9,000 miles or every 12 months, whichever comes around first. And that servicing needn't be too costly because Fiat parts are relatively cheap. A range of Mopar Easy Care maintenance plans allow you to budget ahead for servicing costs for up to five years. Um, what else? Uh, well, this car certainly should be cheap to insure. Uh, ratings range between groups eight and nine, depending on the trim level that you choose. Residual values are better than you might expect them to be on a small, affordable Fiat, if not quite as good as you get from a rival Mini. Uh, expect most 500 variants to hold on to around 40% of their value after three years. That's provided that you don't go too mad with options, of course. What else might you need to know? Uh, well, it's disappointing that Fiat hasn't followed the lead of its brand partner Jeep in offering a five-year warranty on its cars. Here you get three years, but at least it is an unlimited mileage package, uh, free of the 60,000 mile limit that applies to some rivals. Uh, now you can extend that to five years at extra cost. Plus there's 36 months of breakdown cover included as well. Should you have a problem on a journey, you can use the Uconnect infotainment system to contact roadside assistance, and the same setup can also be used to book routine services too. This second generation Fiat 500 breezes into its third decade on sale with as much self-confidence as it had back in 2007. If you're to want one though, you need to be clear about what you're getting here. As ever, it's unapologetically small, so all the same issues in areas like boot space and rear seat accommodation, they still remain. And the engine, now provided uh, for all its hybrid badging, isn't really that electrified at all. We're okay with both those things, and we think many likely customers will be too. The diminutive size continues to make this Fiat perfect for dinky city motoring, and because there's just a light dusting of electrified tech here, prices have been able to remain pretty much as accessible as they were before. Now that is just as well, given the premium price tag which has been applied to the alternative new 500 full battery powered model. Are there issues? Well, of course. Uh, it would be surprising if a design dating back to the noughties didn't show its age in some areas, and you certainly sense that elderly provenance in terms of things like gear shift feel and ride quality if you switch into this car from a more recently evolved city car or super mini. But typical Cinquecento customers really don't tend to care too much about things like that. They'll continue to love the cheeky looks, the friendly feel, and the wide scope for personalization. And thanks to the addition of that mild hybrid power plant, there's no longer the feeling that you're putting up with an old nail beneath the bonnet to get all that trendy tinsel. In summary then, this car remains as likable as ever. Choosing a fashionable little runabout can often be a risk. Here though, is one you can enjoy without a worry. <laughs>